What is language endangerment? Well, first, let's talk about language vitality. We uh, there are a number of different scales that can be used to to measure the vitality of languages. I'm going to be using the expanded expanded graded intergenerational disruption scale. And here, these these definitions come from Ethnologue. I know there are other organizations that do. Uh, language endangerment statistics, but these are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on today. So you can have languages, that the, the, the ones on the screen right now are, are healthy, in, in healthy states, not endangered. So ranging from international languages that are used widely between nations and developing languages like uh, number five in vigorous use with literature in a standardized form being used by some, though this is not yet widespread or sustainable, to 6A vigorous used in face-to-face -face communication by all generations and the situation is sustainable. But then you get to the more concerning stages from 6B to 10. And this is what we're going to be focusing on today. The and by the way, I um, I'm not going to be checking the chat. So if there is something urgent in the chat, um, maybe my co-host can uh, let me know about that. So six B is threatened that the language is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it is losing users. And with regard to um, Jewish languages, that is the stage of Juhuri, which we'll talk about later. The next is shifting, which is the childbearing generation can use the language among themselves, but it is not being transmitted to children. So you see how transmission to children is a big part of these stage definitions, because that is how languages get transmitted. If, if it's transmitted from a parent to a child, then it is not in danger. Next, we have moribund, that the only remaining active users of the language are members of the grandparent generation and older. And many of the Jewish languages are in that stage. Next, we have 8B, nearly extinct. The only remaining users of the language are members of the grandparent generation or older who have little opportunity to use the language. And next is nine, dormant, uh, or I would also say infused can be in that category. The language serves as a reminder of heritage identity for an ethnic community, but no one has more than symbolic proficiency. And finally, 10, extinct, the language is no longer used and no one retains a sense of ethnic identity associated with the language. Um, now, a lot of language activists do not like to use that term extinct because they feel that there's always the possibility that it can become revitalized, and so they prefer to use the term dormant. So these stages are not so black and white. Uh, the way that they're written, it, it makes it seem like it's easy to determine where a language is in within these stages. Like it says, the only speakers are of the grandparent generation. Well, what if there's one young person who speaks it? Another issue is that, uh, and I think this really applies in the case of Jewish languages, is that sometimes the speakers of the endangered language acquire a standard language, but maintain elements of their ancestors' Jewish variety. You see this especially regarding Judeo-Italian and Judeo-Greek. The speakers of Judeo-Italian um, eventually picked up the standard language, as many people in Italy did, based on language policies there, and but they still maintain some elements of their ancestral Judeo-Italian. And so are they considered speakers of the language when you're counting? Same thing with Judeo-Greek, where they picked up standard Greek and used some elements of the Judeo-Greek, some of the distinctive features like Hebrew words that are used with uh, distinctive Greek pronunciations. So another issue, which we talked about last time, is language versus dialect. This is a huge problem when trying to count the number of languages in the world, because 
when there are multiple varieties of, of a particular language, let's say they're mutually intelligible. So then they don't count as a separate language. And what if you say, okay, well, Yiddish is not endangered because it's spoken by Hasidim. But what about the Yiddish varieties that Hasidim do not speak? We certainly get that with uh, Western Yiddish, which is considered to be an endangered language or Judeo-Alsatian, and also uh, considered to be endangered. And, but what about, let's say, um, lang uh, Yiddish that is spoken not by any contemporary Hasidic group or, or Haredi non-Hasidic group that is a particular dialect of Eastern Yiddish? Is that then considered to be an endangered language? Well, maybe it's an endangered dialect of a language that is not endangered. So that is the mutual intelligibility issue really complicates this question. Another complication is whether someone is a speaker or not. Do they have to be fluent to be considered a speaker? Do they have to actually use the language? What if they know it, but they can't uh, they don't have anyone to speak it with, or they, there are people who speak the language, but they don't talk to each other. <laughs> um, and then what if someone is not fluent in the language, doesn't use it for primary communication, but engages with the language by learning it or by singing it? Are they considered to be a speaker when you're counting the number of speakers? So despite these complications, these statistics are still useful for us. And I'd like to add a, an additional angle to our conversation, which is Jeffrey Chandler's notion of post-vernacularity. This is a concept that he came up with when analyzing the way that contemporary people engage with the Yiddish language. They, he found that most people who use Yiddish words and talk about Yiddish outside of Haredi communities cannot understand full Yiddish sentences. And the fact that something is said in Yiddish is more significant than what is actually said. And we're not going to get into too much detail about that now, but it will likely come up, I think maybe in Brian's talk next time about Ladino, but really in all of the talks, there, there might be, and, and this might be a question that you uh, ask the, in, the guest lecturers, what post-vernacular activity is there in the language that they're researching? So some examples of post-vernacular activity within um, contemporary uh, English-speaking countries is Yiddish words used within English sentences or Yiddish tchotchkes, like souvenirs that, that people can buy that commodify the Yiddish language, like you know, little um, stuff 